Uh, in realidad, no, no es una pregunta. Thank you. I don't actually have a question. I wanted really to express some very special thanks because these uh, ladies, these women who have spoken to us, have shared their personal experiences, and I know that's very difficult. So I would like to express my gratitude for all the sessions which feature on the IOM Council's agenda, but particularly for this one because it's really touched us and uh, I want to say how grateful we are for this particular session. We've heard some very interesting things said here today. I was very interested to hear from the individual of uh, Chilean and Peruvian descent. That's very interesting for us and uh, we'll be very useful for our work. The gender issue is very important as well. We always hear that women are vulnerable as migrants, but we'd also like to stress the achievements which they've made and the positions which they've uh, risen to. So thank you very much for the panelists' work and thank you to the IOM. Thank you very much indeed for that intervention. Um, we have another speaker over here, I believe, from Venezuela. Gracias. Thank you. My delegation subscribes to what was just said by Colombia. We share a great deal with Colombia, particularly where migration is concerned. As Colombia was saying, the statements which we've heard were fascinating indeed. And I think this panel is one which has touched all of us here. I think it's very relevant to all of us. So thank you to the panelists. We've heard some very hard-hitting stories, but these are the realities which bring us here to this room to see what we can do to improve the situation. We want to avoid the millions of migrants around the world from feeling alone. Some people have had very lengthy struggles, which probably seemed as though they would never end, but those struggles have, in some cases, ended. Others have struggles which don't end and who are probably now resting in peace in unknown tombs. But we have to think about uh, the very many different situations which migrants face. We've been repeating over the course of this week's debate that we continue to condemn xenophobia and we enshrine that condemnation in our national policies and in our work at the international level, particularly uh, in our work towards the post-2015 agenda. We uh, have a great deal of uh, theories, of course, about uh, all of this, but we need to be practical, too. We need to hone policies. We need to make sure that they're implemented by those responsible for implementation. One thing that Miss Maribe mentioned was insults and very basic rights which should begin at school. And so we know that the first challenge we face is one which relates to education. We need to ensure that the education system is as it should be. We think that through education we can prevent xenophobia from getting into the hands of power. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to espouse what's been said by my colleagues and thank the administration for having 
establish this panel. I'd also like to thank the speakers this afternoon. I'm very pleased to see a women-dominated panel that strengthens me in my feminist stance and uh, undoubtedly bolsters parity, that parity which we seek. So thank you very much. We can see that this panel carries on the theme of uh, other statements we've heard here at the Council. We were very pleased to hear the words of Ms. Samudio and Ms. Maribe in particular. I'd like to thank Cécile Kienje. My first meeting with her took place at the ministerial conference on the diaspora. She met with our minister. And when I met with her, one question which I really wanted to ask her was, please tell me your story. But I wasn't able to ask her to do so because we were busy with other matters at the time. So thanks very much to the IOM for having invited Cecile and for having allowed us to hear her story. I'd also like to thank Ms. Lee for her very significant statement. Even in my country, that statement will be something which can inform our migration policy, and we're currently trying to build in the needs of migrants and new cultures. So those experiences are very useful for us with that. In conclusion, I do have a question for all the panelists. And the question is, do you feel that your status as women has complicated or simplified your experience as migrants? How has it uh, done this and why? Thank you very much. Before we take the question, perhaps we could talk. I think the distinguished delegate of the Democratic Republic of Congo will speak. Thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. I'd like to thank the panelists for their very informative and useful statements. My question goes to Ms. Kienge, a member of the European Parliament. Madam Cecile, Migration in Italy and in Europe is clearly having an influence on policies. Integration of foreign migrants is an issue which affects politics. You, as a parliamentarian, have also been active in a number of associations. You've also been involved in a number of meetings relating to migration and its consequences. Over the course of your battle and your parliamentary work, would you say that the image of migrants in general and African migrants in particular is changing, is improving, and is public opinion? becoming more understanding is a greater understanding of migration being achieved. We know that a great deal of meetings are held, events, but can we see that perceptions are beginning to change? Is the image of migrants beginning to change, in your opinion? Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. 
It's a difficult question to answer, in fact. I don't think the image of migrants as such has really changed. I'm having a number of difficulties in the parliament at the moment, and that's why I'm creating a group against racism, against discrimination, because immigration is, to some extent, still seen as something to be feared, as something which is linked to crime. And migrants are often put into the same basket as criminals. So I think we need social change. I'm not discouraged, however. I think we need to put in a great deal of work on this. And in my political group and in other political groups which share these ideas, we have called for a line of work to take place for a change of approach to immigration because while ever immigration is seen as a danger, as a threat, it will be very difficult to set up policies which look to migrants' needs, and I think we need to work towards a common policy on behalf of the entire community. Now, this is very difficult. We have directives, we have laws which are made by the parliament and apply to the entire community, but these directives and laws are not applied uniformly acro across all the 28 member states. This is a significant weakness because we need to try to apply what appears in the statutes of the European Union. Solidarity, joint responsibility, that has to apply across the 28 member states. So this is a very significant line of work and it's a very sensitive area as well. We need to try and work on the image of migrants and on the language which is used to describe them. Now when I embarked upon my first term in Italy, I uh, had a very simple motto, I'm not coloured, I'm black. That's a transparent language. We need to call a spade a spade. We need to say things how they are, and we need to show respect for the people who stand before us. This is also a message which I've tried to transmit in Europe, because as parliamentarians, we need to begin seeing migrants as a source of wealth, as a resource rather than a problem. So we need to work a great deal on that. And that's why I'm very much engaged in thinking about citizenship. That's still a priority in many countries. While ever individuals can't forge a firm identity, firm idea of who they are, integration will be difficult. But we're working on it. Thank you very much. We're, we're approaching the end of the session. Um, before turning the, the floor to Ms. Lee to answer on the question on the status of women and how that affects things, I'd like to make a rather naked plug for the coming year we have a social media campaign which is designed to try and unpack the perception of migrants and try and get people to look at migrants with a more positive eye. And the, I think the panelists here are a perfect reflection of that because they've succeeded in, in the country and they are succeeding or have already succeeded in the countries that, that they are now living in. So for those of you who are not very aware of social media, you, I'm sure you have younger people who can ask about it, but the general idea is that we'll be looking for every country to produce a list of its migrant heroes. Who are the people from your country who are living abroad and making a serious contribution to human endeavors? We don't just want to know about football players, but we want to know about proper contributors uh, that, that you're proud of in your own right. So with that, I'll pass it I'm just going to touch on what uh, was mentioned by, uh, about the status of if the status uh, as a woman is complicated or simplified things for me. Uh, you have to under we have to understand that the difference of how multiculturalism is being seen in Korea. It actually started, it actually started with marriage migrants. As I have mentioned during my uh, during my speech, most uh, of the multicultural policies in Korea stem from policies for the family. So, uh, and 80 percent of the marriage migrants in Korea are women. 80 percent plus. 
80 plus percent are women. So uh, uh, when the society gave the opportunity uh, for migrants to be able to to be able to express themselves or to be able to go out and work for the society, uh, most of the um, uh, most most of them are most of those given the chance are women because they are the ones who they are the ones who are, heading, who, uh, who are actually most of the women migrant women uh, migrant migrants are women so uh, most of those who got the chance to be able to work on or to be able to go out into society and do something are women so in, in, in short my status as a woman in korea actually um, actually simplified uh, going to the top or breaking glass ceilings back in korea and i also would like to uh, um, also would like to mention uh, the, the thing about the education to battle xenophobia. Um, I think it is really very important. It's actually one of the first laws, first bills that actually passed when I became a member of the Assembly. Korea, as I've mentioned, has been uh, proud uh, of its heritage as being, uh, as being uh, uh, homogenous in a way, and uh, textbooks are actually teaching children that uh, you should be proud of being one blood. But now it's actually changing. And uh, one of the, the bills that I passed is actually to have um, education, multi in understanding multiculturalism for students in school. So I think it's really very important uh, for everyone, especially in Korea starting out, uh, especially in countries starting out, but, you know, it's, it's trying to open its door for immigration to start in and to be able to educate children uh, regarding, xenophobia, regarding xenophobia or regarding what discrimination or prejudice is. Um, uh, we're approaching the end of the session, but I see two flags up. So shall I ask the distinguished representative of Germany to please make an intervention? Thank uh, William uh, Swing and his staff for organizing such an interesting morning session on post-2015 uh, UN development agenda in this, in this afternoon, having this uh, very convincing presentation of migrants' voices. My only remaining wish would be that you can present or we can present that kind of presentation to a wider audience, and maybe we can use the links of Ms. Lee to the television to uh, make it broader, it would be my only plea. And thanks again to IOM for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's heartily endorsed around the room today. Um, could we speak to the, hear from the di distinguished delegate of Ethiopia, please? Um, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we are very happy with this panel, which is, uh, we also join our colleague from uh, Germany by thanking IOM for this wonderful panel. Uh, we often talk about multiple forms of discrimination, uh, xenophobia, intolerance, and racism faced by migrants, and this panel has brought about the different aspects of this discrimination, uh, which is faced by migrants and their families, and which is faced irrespective of their status. Uh, the experience of the panelists in their different government posts and the, descend the descendants of the migrants and the problems related with the integration is, was uh, fascinating to listen to. It has also brought about the issues that are often neglected but needs to be um, addressed, which is uh, the, the issues of families of migrants, uh, especially the one touched by the last two panelists. Uh, uh, we have two. I mean, I have two questions. The first one is, um, what do you think about, uh, needs to be done to ensure the integration of migrants and their families in the destination countries? Because I many of the elements that they touched upon, though they they have lived in the destination countries for years, they, there's still problems the way I see it in, the in, in their integration and then in the way they are approached by the host communities and what needs more, what, what needs to be done uh, in your view? And um, do you think the manifestations of like racism, xenophobia, intolerance, and, uh, have, have they changed and give, gain new aspects, especially after listening to the, uh, the uh, comments from uh, Ms. Uh, Zamudia, if I'm, if I'm the, uh, the last uh, panelist, she was talking about the um, 
the questions that are forwarded to her, which where, where she's from, it, it actually violated her private space, and then it, it kind of relates to racism, and it was kind of interesting, and then it, it, it actually made me to think whether, you know, the manifestations have changed and it has gained, you know, new dynamics, just for you to comment on those things. Um, who would like to take the first, the first part of that question? Uh, Yes, uh, we have to note that in order to provide assistance to migrants in terms of integration in the host societies, we need to provide support for them. There are some countries who have policies with regard to housing, which is not, which does not include a point where they can meet a uh, population, but rather the formation of ghettos. Uh, where uh, migrants live together and closing on themselves. So there needs to be good integration. There needs to be support from local institutions and instruments. Which will provide information on all the rights of migrants in the country where the migrants are integrated. And this will ensure good integration, the possibility of having direct contact with the local uh, population. That enables people to know who, who, is, who are the new persons coming in to their country. Who are these new people that we're going to have to deal with? There is a lack in this uh, regard, and, and so the cliches continue. Uh, the delegate from Morocco asked a question which is also linked to this last question, the fact of being a woman. For me, this has complicated life for me because women always have the stereotypes that they have to deal with, especially uh, women of African origin. It, it, you're, you're black, you come from Africa. I was a doctor, I worked in hospitals before I entered the political life. And the question which was always put to me was, but are you uh, 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 African American? meaning it was less serious. So if I was black and African-American, it was less serious than if I was black and African. So we have a long way to go. I was guilty because I was black, I was guilty because I was a woman, and I was guilty because I was born abroad. And I was guilty because I dared to study. I dared to occupy a position of responsibility, and as a woman, I, did, I shouldn't do that. So that just overthrew all the tabus and really complicated my life. And this is why I still receive, I still am subject to attacks and insults. And this is why I can no longer walk around freely in Italy. This is what I'm saying. It's as a result of what I'm telling you about. When the country takes, becomes aware of this and develop uh, programs to raise awareness about these stereotypes and cliches, then we can have good integration policies. I would also add that two weeks ago, I called the uh, Minister of in Integration in Belgium when he, after he made some racist uh, remarks, I asked him to uh, look at the uh, to look at the Congo and uh, we need to look at the effect of colonization in schools. There are still books that talk about uh, ethnic uh, uh, roots and stereotypes which highlight differences and the fact that we're not the same. 
dream. And if we really want to work on integration, we need to look at school programs. We need to start with that. Look at communication programs. We also need to review our policies so that there is real mixing and integration among people. So this has really uh, complicated my life, but it has made me stronger today. Thank you very much. I mean, if I can say there's one very strong theme running through our talk today, which is certainly one of the need for respect, and the one, the one for, for a parity of esteem, for migrants to be given the same esteem as the, uh, of other people in the country. Maybe we'll ask uh, Mr. Mida, perhaps you can respond to the delegate from Ethiopia, and, and then we'll, we'll allow Ms. Lee to speak in conclusion. Thank you. Um, well, it's a good question, <laughs> but um, I think that you were asking if the manifestation of xenophobia perhaps has changed and, and um, comes in different forms. Um, I think, yes, um, I think it's something that is very, has become perhaps more subtle. Um, and I think you become sort of fine-tuned to it. Uh, and for me, the resistance that I show perhaps in the beginning when uh, asked the endless questions um, is sort of a test, you know, because if they, if, if the, if they respond with sort of a hostile, uh, offended way, then, then I know more what was the thought behind, you know. And if they accept, then this also tells me something. Um, and I think what lies behind is maybe the story of what a Norwegian looks like. Because I've, I've compared notes with friends who also have uh, migrant parents, but from European white countries. And, um, and, and, and we sort of see the difference, you know, in uh, in how they are um, met and and what kind of questions they are asked and, and how they are accepted. So, yes, definitely, I think it's something fine-tuned, and I think it has something to do with with um, what we defined as a Norwegian Norwegian appearance or the appearance of a person from a certain country. Um, uh, I couldn't stress more how, about how pretty new the multi-ethnic, multicultural phenomenon is in Korea um, as compared with other countries. And, uh, I think it's in a, in a very good position to actually uh, see how other countries uh, did before and to set up new, uh, to set up new ways or to set up new policies to be able to have a Korea, a multicultural Korea all on its own. Um, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things that I did even before I came to the assembly, even if, before I joined politics, is to better the perception, is to uh, go out there and better the perception of people about uh, about, about migrants. And uh, as I met these people, most of uh, this, I had uh, had a lot of xenophobic attacks, especially when I first started in politics. All of those people that has been um, cheering me on while I was on television or while I was in the movies, actually, in a sudden twist, in a sudden, in a sudden change of position, became. Uh, started to attack me xenophobically. So uh, uh, I think it is more of, and it is, I, I, at first it didn't understand maybe if it's just because, if it's because I'm moving up the ladder or or, or, or it's in a different thing. But most of the people that we met, with, which is very negative when it comes to foreigners or to foreign people, most of them, most of the hatred or most of the xenophobic attacks that they've been doing stem more from having a negative experience with migrants. So uh, before a lot of those negative experiences go on within the society, I think it's, uh, I think it's very important uh, for people in Korea and for a lot of migrants in Korea to be able to, uh, to, be able to go out there and better the perception of, of, of uh, the majority uh, regarding migrants. Now, when, um, about the integration part, I think uh, as of the moment, 
uh, one of the best things that the government actually, the, the Korean government is actually now doing is, yes, assisting in having policies. I think Korea has uh, one of the best policies when it comes to support uh, supporting the migrant communities. But one thing that is very important is uh, for the local gov for the governments to actually support the migrant communities. Like, there's a lot of communities within Korea, the Filipino communities, the Vietnamese communities, the Cambodian communities, and these communities actually uh, have the experience and have been in Korea earlier, and they will actually, and, and a lot of them are actually very willing to help with the integration of the new people coming in, uh, coming in within Korea. So it's very important for the government itself to be able to actually help these migrant communities, uh, this, uh, yes, the migrant communities itself. And uh, uh, there's one uh, funny thing that I saw, and it, uh, we were talking uh, earlier about the diaspora. Um, I went to this village in, uh, in, in Korea once, and I saw that all of the old people, and the Korean people in that village were trying to learn Vietnamese. And so I, was, I was wondering, why are, you tra why are you learning Vietnamese? Because they were saying there's a lot, because there's a lot of marriage migrant here, or migrant wives here who are from Vietnam. And I said, uh, why is it that you are the ones learning Vietnamese when actually the Vietnamese women should be the one who is learning Korean? They said, oh, well, we are thankful that they came to us. And then they actually made this village alive again. And uh, and I was asking the, um, the Viet that Vietnamese uh, woman next door, and she, how did you come here? Oh, I was, it was because someone recommended me or, 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 uh, or recommended me um, recommended me to my husband. And who is that someone? Oh, she lives next door. And then I found out that within that village, we have a lot of Vietnamese women married to Korean men who was um, married to Korean men who came from one particular village in Vietnam too. So it's a connection. And 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 with that, within that village, we can see how strong, and we can see how strong, um, uh, we, we can see how strong uh, the connection between all of the people, the village itself and the local government unit itself are trying to help all of these migrant, uh, migrant communities and all of these people. Uh, and the migrants themselves are trying to actually help each other to integrate and to have a better uh, life within, uh, within Korea. Thank you very much. That's riveting end to our, to our discussion. So if there's no further interventions, uh, I think we can bring this panel to a close. It's been a privilege to be here in the minority position and to feel what it's like to be at the, at the other end of the spectrum when we've got such brilliant uh, guests with us and such really terrific and brave people. So it's been an absolute honor to be among you today. Thank you very much for listening and for contributing.